Good morning, saints. Praise God forevermore. This is part 7 of our teaching, Sitting in Christ Jesus, part 7 of our lesson. As we get into a deeper and a more intense revelation of what God wants to do in these last hours of time, everything with God is on time. Everything is apropos with Him. The things that we're about to learn today are going to be very necessary as we go into what is about to happen in our personal lives uh, individually and also nationally and maybe even worldwide. So um, he knows what's going on. Nothing catches God unawares. He's in control as it pertains to those who are submitted to him where he can get his instruction over to them and will be divinely protected by his hand, his angels, and his precious blood. Amen. So <clears throat> I want everybody to just focus on the Lord right now. Focus on, on Jesus is the glory light that comes out of him. See him standing before you with his love pouring out of him to you. See his outstretched arms like this, beckoning for you to come into him. And then when you get to him, just see him put his arms around you and hold you tight. Empty yourself out of the world's cares, fretfulness, worries, anxieties, you know, and any type of fear that would try to interimpose uh, a worry upon you at all. Be carefree, just let it go. Give it to Jesus. That's his function. That's his job. Amen. And just receive his peace. <clears throat> you know, drink it in. Receive it deep into your heart. Let your mind be settled so you can listen to the message and apply it during the week. Hallelujah. Just, just meditate on him for a moment. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Have the Holy Spirit rest upon you. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Blessed be the Holy Spirit of the living God. Thank you, Lord. You have an expectation to receive. Remember what we talked about, the anticipation. The anticipation, the expectation to receive. The Holy Ghost is looking for those who are eager to receive from Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My people understand this in His body, in these United States and throughout the world. Although the enemy is trying to put trepidation on all peoples and put fear and concern and worry upon them, where he's trying to steal, kill, and destroy, <clears throat> take people out in many different areas and functions and designs and devices that he has, be not worried. For I've already seen everything. Yes, I've seen his works. And I put all of his destructive works, even on the cross 2,000 years ago. Even though, my people, you're living in this present day, in this present hour, 2,000 years ago, I saw all his methods, his methodologies and the things and the situations. I saw the circumstances that he was going to try to array against you. Yes, specifically you. And I already captured them. And I put them on that cross 2,000 years ago. I'm not bound by time. What he does today and tomorrow and you know and whatever in the future, I've already captured those. I already defeated those on the three days and three nights also after my son's defeat, where he defeated him at the cross. <clears throat> I want my people to come into this peace and rest now because times are going to be into a place where there's going to be a lot, a lot, a lot of shaking is going to go on. A lot of it will be me, some of it will be me because these institutions must fall. Why? Because the kingdom of God must arise and I want your dependency to be on the spirit world where all your supply and all your provision is inside. And you can extract it just simply by releasing the words of your mouth by faith, and your words are that conveyor belt to bring from the spirit world into the natural your provision, and my glory, and my light, and my healing power, and my protection for you. <clears throat> Certain nations are going to capitulate to the enemy quicker than others, but I've got the glory on you, and I've got the glory in my hand upon this country because a lot of my people have prayed and they prayed sincerely and they prayed diligently. Don't stop. And also pray for those who have no chance. If the children of God do not pray and give forth their light unto the darkness, these people will perish into the hands of the enemy and they'll be lost for all eternity. So even though they are under this influence, don't chide them. Have compassion for them and pray for them. Loosen the blood of the Lamb over the entire nation, over the peoples who are running that country. Break the power of the devil off of them. Bind him tightly. Bind his mouth, eyes, and ears, and tell the devil you are defeated. Tell him that death has been destroyed and abolished. 
and tell him that everlasting life and immortality and the glory and revelation knowledge and truth and the resurrection power of the Son of the living God will flood their hearts and minds and bring them the revelation of truth and liberty and freedom, emancipation from all bondage and enticements and entanglements that the enemy would try to interimpose against them. Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. Remember, the church, my body, has a dominion in this planet. It is my church, my body, who has the authority here on the earth. Everything that happens here is because the church allowed it to happen, even in the negative side. You tolerated it, and because you acquiesced and did not take authority and block it and stop it, the enemy was able to get a foothold where he shouldn't have been. He's already been defeated. He's legally been destroyed. Yes, but my people, because they did nothing, just like Adam in the garden did nothing, he didn't take authority over that, that fallen spirit. No, the devil himself. He didn't do it. So he succumbed to all of his plots, his plans. He fell and destruction came upon the whole earth and through the humanity. Not anymore, saints. These are, you are the salt of the earth. You are the children of light. This is the day and hour that my body will be exalted as they exalt my son Jesus Christ within you and upon you through the power of the Holy Ghost. It's time for the mature ones to grow up. I'm going to do a quick work in my people's hearts and minds. I'm going to give you the Word of God speedily. What would take normally 50 years to acquire the Word, I'm going to do a quick work, and you're going to get this Word sowed into your hearts. Those who are diligent to receive, those who have an expectancy to receive, those who have an anticipation to receive, I'll do a quick work inside of you. So you, yes, yes, you'll be giants in the words of righteousness. I want you to receive this Word today. Yes, and ponder the prophecies over and over and this message corresponding thereafter. Receive this message, my beloved. Receive, receive, for these are the words of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just pause and receive what the Holy Spirit had to give unto you today. Just receive it. Just receive it. The Lord's constantly speaking to us. The Lord's constantly giving instruction unto his people all the time. The Lord is always doing these things for us. We just need to have an eye to see and an ear to hear. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. Alrighty, saints. So turn to the book of Hebrews where we left off last week. We're not going to spend a lot of time here. We've laid the framework and the groundwork. Remember how we left last week's teaching off, though. I said today we're going to give a lot of examples on how to work the works of righteousness so that you're going to be so sharp using the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, that you're going to discern properly what is good and what is evil. And based on these examples, once you get a foundation of how this thing works, you can use any situation. <clears throat> always default. Whenever you are unsure about something, always default to the Word of God. That's your safety net. Okay, the righteousness of God and work in His Word to what? To, ex to pro be you know, proficient in the words of your rights always default to the Word of God. You can never lose doing it that way. For His Word gives forth entrance of light, life, and love into your heart, mind, and soul. It's an anchor. Hallelujah. <coughs> Praise God. Let's read these two verses and sum, sum up what they say, and then we're going to get into the examples concerning these verses. For everyone, everyone, okay, that drinks milk is unskillful in the words of righteousness, for he is a baby, okay? You didn't know how to use it. You weren't taught it. You know, you functionally are too much of a newborn to have any clue on what to do. So the enemy took advantage of our lack of understanding. Verse 14, but those who are, look what it says here, but strong meat belongeth to them. So it belongs to you who are full age, and that word full age, as we've been talking about, means you've come into a full maturity of understanding what this word and your inheritance is. Okay? If you have little knowledge of an inheritance, then you're going to be taken advantage of by the people who know more about that, about that last will and testament than you do. But if you are dominant on what you have in front of you and you know what your rights are, nobody's going to be able to swindle these things from you, especially the enemy. <clears throat> okay. But strong meat belongs to them who are full age, even to them, 
or by them who by reason listen to this by reason you know what that word reason means it's the soul the mind will and the emotions it's your thinking processes it's how you acquire knowledge a lot of people acquire knowledge and they make a quick determinate decision on what this knowledge is telling them you can't you have to some I mean, when you're driving a car that's great you know when you're dealing with things in the natural uh, so you need that spontaneity to avoid catastrophe in your life. But it goes on to say here, even those who by reason of use or habitual use, continual use, every moment use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So we come, remember what it said in Proverbs chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 5 and 6, that we're to trust in the Lord with all of our heart, Lean not unto our own understanding in our head, but in all thy ways, all thy ways, acknowledge him. Acknowledge is a big word, and he shall direct and lead and guide your paths. <clears throat> acknowledge is saying, Lord, okay, I believe that the kingdom of God is real, so therefore I release the glory within and upon me. I open up an aperture in the heaven. The kingdom of God is released and activated within me. Okay, I acknowledge that. I acknowledge that you are my righteousness and my standing before heaven and earth and before the circumstances of life before the powers of darkness, amen, before every situation that I'll ever do or go through, amen. And I also acknowledge that Jesus is my standing of righteousness. He is the righteousness of God. I seek the kingdom and this righteousness that God has, who, and that happens to be Jesus. So Jesus is my righteousness before my Father concerning any situation, answered prayer, deliverance, breakthrough, health, healing, no matter what it is. And you have to use it. You're acknowledging. By you acknowledging, you're showing that you're using and, and, and exercising, exercising by reason of use, what? The words of righteousness. That goes on to say, amen here. They have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Remember what good and evil is. It's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil that Adam and Eve ate off of the garden, in the garden, and they fell. And it's, it'll always pronounce death to you. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. We talked about that last week, but the ends thereof is death. It was a false trail. You're only going to get the right trail out of from your inner man where God breaks through this natural veil, okay, where you only can see a certain distance, and he'll pull that curtain back and show you revelation knowledge, what truth is real, what really happened in your life, what is really going on behind the scenes. Amen. So those who, by reason of use, can discern both good and evil. Our whole life, all day long, and like we talked about last week, tens of, uh, who knows, 10,000 decisions we make a day, 20, 30, depending on what you do, all of them are determined upon those two trees in a garden, either the tree of life, which is the word of God representing Jesus, as that word, or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where you say, God, you take a back seat, I'll run this whole gig by myself, and my life, and we'll see how things go. Well, they're going to go straight downhill if you do that only. Okay? Your soul is submitted to your spirit. It's spirit on top, soul, your mind, will, and emotions, and your sense gates, and your understanding, and your mental prowess, and your physical body's third. Okay? It's not soul on top, and, you know, we'll squelch and throw the spirit man in the back compartment here, and don't talk to me ever again. You do that, you're in for destruction. Okay, now look how man's been designed by the devil. He get you know would come out of the birth canal, would go to these schools of you know lower learning, not higher learning anymore in this country. Okay, and so what do we do? We develop our mind, will, and emotions, and our intellect, so our souls exalted, our minds exalted, and then we'll go to the gyms and we exercise, and all that's great. Okay, and it's 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 a good thing, all at the expense of our spirit man who's in the back burner. Okay, we threw him in the back seat of the car and told him to be quiet. Where really we should have been highly developed with our spirit man. Our spirit man's designed to be your, the leader of the pack, to lead and guide you. Then your soul is supposed to follow the leader or your spirit man. And then your body is supposed to follow your soul. Spirit, soul, and body. <clears throat> okay, but the world magnifies the, the soul because the devil can manipulate that. He's the god of this world. So he set up the educational system to exalt that part and never mention the inner man, the, the power man, 
the man's full of glory, the anointing, the power, and the, you know, the miracle working ability of Almighty God, that spirit man inside of you, and so people go without. So all day long, you're making all the decisions, and how many decisions are we making based on the word, the kingdom of God that you're in, that we're leaning on that righteousness of God, where God is on our, our standard of perfection for all that we do, say or think, amen? Do we, are we inclusive in bringing God into every decision and thought that we have? Or is he back on that back burner again? Okay, Lord, I did my daily devotions with you. I did my daily prayers. Now I'm going to go into the world system, and I'm going to throw you in and toss you in the back seat. It doesn't work that way. Always bring God to the forefront first. Okay? Lean not unto your own understanding. I trust in the Lord. The Lord's a spirit being. He spirits talk to spirit. Spirit to spirit. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Your heart is, your, is, a, is a commingling of your mind, will, and emotions to your spirit, man. And lean not unto your own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him. And then he shall lead, direct, and guide your paths in the natural world. Okay? When you do that, you're going to enter into the realm of the superman and woman status. Now you've left this mundane lower standard of lost failure and defeat, and now you're starting to enter into a realm of, of, a, of a, the God kind of class that God originally intended for Adam to walk in in the beginning. Amen? So all these decisions all day long, are you based on the tree of life? Where you're walking by revelation knowledge from Father, where you've given him first place in that decision, so he has an entrance to help you making a, a natural decision through your soul? Or you're just ignoring him totally and just using your brain power? Oh, Pastor, during my job, I don't have time to count, be counseling with God. No, you don't understand. All I have to say, Father, I thank you that Jesus is my wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and counsel this day. You go into your workplace. Lord, I, I plead the blood of Jesus over my workplace. The angels of God are here. I break the power of the devil in my workplace so they're not going to write, you know, high carnival here. I set the standard where the atmosphere is heavens now in my workplace. Amen? And I give God, the Holy Spirit, the encouragement to have his wisdom flowing through me. His wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel dominating my thinking process. Lord, you do have first place in my life. Now go to work. Now do your studying. Go do your research. Now you're doing whatever you're doing at your job site. Now go ahead and do it. You've given God first place, and now all of a sudden you start doing things in a more efficient way. And half the time, God leads you with clues. Look over here. Look over there. Do this. Do that instead of this, this, and that. And before you know it, you're going to achieve everything ten times quicker. Why? You've now partnered with deity. The God who happens to run and stay in the universe. Just him. Okay? Just him. You've given him every opportunity to be a dominator here in this life. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Do I have a hallelujah? Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to read here in my notes real quick here. So always start the day using your righteousness in Christ, depending on that righteousness in Christ, even saying Jesus is my righteousness and my standard of perfection before my Father. He's my standard of answered prayer before my Father. He's my standard of a miracle-working power before my Father. I've got great favor between God and all, and all men because Jesus is my standing of favor before my Father and all men on my behalf. Amen? So he's your substitute, your go-between, your advocate, general, okay? Whenever you use the righteousness of God, that is your safeguard, like I said last week, your pillar of truth, your foundational cornerstones, it's your anchor for your soul, and make all your decisions based on that foundation and platform, and then you're going to do well in life. <clears throat> we gave an example last week about, you know, about a job. Let's say you want to maybe leave where you are, and Lord, I, I want to look for a new place to go, but you don't know what to do. You have no idea what... You know, the enemy could set all kinds of landmines in your pathway, but if you're just going by your mind, will, and emotions and your sense gates without asking for the counsel of Almighty God, well, Pastor, I don't want to ask God because I'm not sure I'm going to really hear from him. I'm not even sure that I, he's going to lead and guide me. Yeah, he will, because the scripture says that my people, okay, who I'm your shepherd, they know the voice of their shepherd, and the voice of a stranger they will not follow. That's God's promise to you. When the time is necessary and the time to come for you to hear that voice or to know that leading and that nudge inside of you or you have a you know an access point of peace rather than a check in your spirit and say, stop, 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 that's God. Okay? That's God. 
<clears throat> so if you say him, you know what? I'm going to take this job rather than that one because this job looks good. It's paying more than this other one. But you didn't know that the company was going to go out of business in a year. You didn't know that they were going to pay, maybe put some uh, unburdened you know, things against you or mandates or some type of oppression. You don't know that. Where the other companies got all kinds of liberty flowing through it. Okay? So what, you, what should you do? Okay? Rather say, Jesus is my wisdom. He's my righteousness and my standing before my Father to make proper decisions in life. How's that one? Is that a beautiful scripture to say and statement to make? Isn't it? That Jesus is my standard of perfection <clears throat> to make right and proper decisions in life? I choose to lean on him, and he will lead and guide my paths. Just like it said in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Acknowledge him in all thy ways, and he shall lead, direct, and guide your paths. Because you acknowledge him first. The preeminent one. Amen. God thrives and loves when you do that. <clears throat> Let's look at a, a verse where you can count on the wisdom of God. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. I want to give you verses to back up everything I say so that you know that it's scriptural and it's foundational. You can always go back and lean on these things to know that they're the right thing. Amen. Okay, in verse 30, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says this, But of him, meaning God, are you in Christ Jesus? It's because of God that you're in Christ Jesus. That's the Father that put you in Him when you received Jesus as Lord and Savior. But it's of God that you are in Christ Jesus. And God, the word who there is representing the Father there, who of God, okay, Jesus is of who God, has been made unto us. Jesus has been made unto us wisdom. So in other words, Jesus is your wisdom. Lord, I thank you that Jesus is my standard of righteousness concerning your wisdom for me today. All the wisdom that I need in life is going to flow directly from your very own throne room, from the very being who runs and sustains the universe, who knows everything. He knows the future. He knows the best pathways of life and it always has my best interests at heart. Always is loaded with good things to come in my life. Amen? Hallelujah. Jesus who is of God has been made unto me wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. There it is. So, do you pray for wisdom? No. Because this scripture says that you already have it. It says, who of God has been made unto us. So, what do you say? If you're looking for a job, or even if you're in the middle of your, your workplace, and you're doing this or doing that, and you need to make a decision, say, thank you, Lord, that Jesus is my wisdom concerning this decision that I have to make right now. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for leading and guiding me into an open pathway where I can see what decision or where you want me to go concerning whether it be a job, research that you're doing, or something that you're doing in your workplace concerning decision-making processes. Amen? <clears throat> Amen? Jesus has been made unto me wisdom. How do you like that one? I mean, there are things that will happen to you in life that when you do things like that, the Holy Ghost will take over because you've, in you've invited him in. God wants to co-partner with you. He didn't just make you so that you can go about doing your thing in your whole life and say, I hope you, may, you hope you get saved and I'll see you when you get to heaven, children. No, he made you so that he could have fellowship with you all day long. He wanted to be a part of our lives. He wanted to experience, you know, the joys of life, you know, that we'll go through every day that we have him and experience those emotions, those thoughts, those tendencies and be a part of every decision-making process that you'll go through. I gave this testimony a long time ago. Um, I, I, was, I went to RIT, and I was in this one class called Probabilities. I had no idea what the guy was talking about, honestly. <clears throat> this guy would talk a mile a minute. And, um, and he goes, well, here's the exam. The final exam came, okay? I mean, this guy was so confusing... I skipped his class a lot because I just knew it was a waste of time to go, but I knew I had to still go and take the final exam. God is my witness. Here's the Bible right here. Puts the exam in front of me, and I go, this is going to be something. <laughs> so I said, Lord, and I was just a baby Christian back then, and I said, Lord, I th and I said, Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're the wisdom of God. How, lead and guide me into, you know, making the correct 
choices and these uh, answers here. And thank goodness it was a multiple choice. I mean, it would have been something, well, well, tell us about this, 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 and that. Then I would have been sunk because, you know, I would have had to hear God speaking to me, in, you know, repetitively in an audible voice. So it was multiple choice, and I was doing this, 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 and that, and I was just inclined to go here and do this one, do that one, do this, but I put God first. I was totally dependent on him, okay? I go to hand the paper, and the guy who, remember now, he knew me because I wasn't in his class much. He must have thought I was a wise guy, right? Or what is this guy? He either got it all together, and he thinks my class is boring, or I blew him out, and he's going to get a zero on his paper, right? And so I handed it in. And he goes, I can't believe this. <laughs> I got one wrong on the whole test, okay? And he gave me an A, and I go, and I, I didn't even attend the class, so it must have galled him a little bit. But, you know, it was right in front of him. I just, I, it was a move of God. There's no other way to explain it. I was talking to Cindy before we did our service today, and um, the Lord, you know, gave me a recollection. We went down to the Believers uh, Convention, Kenneth Copeland ran one in North Carolina back in 1982 um, 82 around, right? Well, we owned and operated a, a survival store and also a health and nutrition store merged together, but we also had a bakery, which was my partner Mike Ricotta, had a bakery connected next to us. So I go, well, what are we going to do about the store? You know, we were just getting those kerosene heaters in and they were really blowing out. We were making a lot of money back then. And I go, we're, going, we're leaving at the zenith, and there, everybody was starting to get them. I go, all our competition, if we lock the door, are going to go to the other place. Well, I said, Lord, I, I have to believe that you're our sustainer in all things, that you'll, you'll, you'll defend us, you'll you know, promote us, you'll protect us. So Mike goes, let's go to the Believer's Convention and leave the door open. With no proprietor there, we weren't there to mine the registers, nothing. Just people, I mean, if people could have walked in, they could have ransacked the whole store and emptied us totally out. Well, you're stupid. What presumption? You guys are out of your minds. Back then, I mean, we were into the Word so tightly, and we were listening to messages four or five, six hours a day, you know, in that store. And then I had a great day job, you know, paid me well, and I listened another eight hours at that place. So I was totally convinced that the Word was real. I mean, it really became more real to me than anything else. But between us and the bakery, there was an open door. So Mike said, look it, um, we'll tell the girl who operates the bakery to every once in a while to just walk through that open door and see if anybody's in the store, okay? And if she heard, we put a bell on the door. So if anyone went in, it would be loud enough. You know, so I go, but Mike, what, uh, what would you do if um, the bell rang, somebody came in our store, but there was a bunch of customers in the bakery? He goes, God. I go, you're right, God. So we went and had a good time at the Believer's Convention. I would call every once in a while to see what was happening. And these heaters ran a couple hundred dollars. So all you had to do was get five little sales and you were over a thousand dollars in the register. And they would mount pretty quick because they were blown out of the store big time at that time. So come to find out, we had one of the greatest weeks. We went there for five days, I believe, came home. It was one of the greatest weeks that we ever had at the store. The girl would come, she'd drink, you know, hear that bell and go in there and make a sell and all that and this, you know, and there was times that she didn't. People, you know, would, do, back then it must have been total honesty or God really checked their heart and put fear in them that something would be wrong if they stole it. I mean, they could have walked right out and nobody would know. There was no cameras, nothing. Just pure God. We made a fortune that week. But I came home and I praised God totally, you know, constantly. I thanked the girl that would come back, you know, once in a while and through and and what she did, and she watched over the store. I told her, you know, every, one, every five customers, you know, put the money away. We use some common sense. But think about that. How many people would ever do something like that? They'd probably lock you up. But not if you're into the word day and night. Not if that word becomes more real to you. And don't forget, while we did all that, we're at a believer's convention on top of that. So we're really getting all whipped up and psyched up in our spirit man, man at that time, okay? So... I'm not saying that that's something you, you should do at this point because you have to be highly developed in the Word of God to do anything even closer to resemble that. But those are the foundational things that built me up in life where I grew thereby, okay? Back then we were praying in, you know, in the Spirit, you know, four to eight hours a day, you know, when we were, you know, have, having our home church all the time. We had a great deliverance ministry back then. 
casting out devils at, with people. We'd have strangers walking off the street that we didn't even know. They said, God told me to come here. And I said, what do you need? She goes, well, I got a devil in me. People actually said that. Can you believe that? Come down, cast the devil out of them, and they'd go, and I'd never see them. You'd think they'd say, hey, hello, and you know, leave us an offering or something, right? Do something. Never heard from them. I just praise God all the more. We were like God's little hospital centers, like you see on every corner now. People would come, get delivered, get healed, get set free, and go. I'm saying all that to say this. This stuff is real. This stuff is really real. And when the more you get your mind renewed to the Word of God, to where all of a sudden everything in the natural is dull. It, be, it has no life to it anymore. It has no you know, substance. It has no more control over you. To where you know that you know that you know that your Father God and His righteousness is the greatest thing that you can ever touch or tap into. Hallelujah. The scripture says that Jesus is our righteous, righteousness as well. It says that he's also your sanctification. That's another big thing we can, we're can we going to get into one of these days. Sanctification is holiness, but people think that holiness is walking around with your hands like this all day long and being pious. No, holiness is an outward show of your inward righteousness. Again, righteousness. God made you his righteousness through the born-again experience. So you're always going to do right things. That's part of being, you know, discerning to do right and wrong, good or evil. You see somebody ill, you lay hands on them. That's what? Exercising your what? Rights to do what? That which is right. As a, remember, holiness is an outward show of your inward righteousness or your inward rights. You're showing what your rights, that you believe in the rights that God gave you, what your Bill of Rights intended you to be. You're a believer, so lay hands on a sick and get them recovered. Okay? Sanctification is a great thing when you know what it's all about. God justified you and made you perfect, for Jesus is our sanctification. Well, how do you know that, Pastor? Same way that he's your wisdom. They're all together here. Look at the verse again. That God has been made, had made Jesus to be unto us our wisdom, our righteousness, what we've been talking about, our sanctification, and our redemption for all the things that we need of what he bought and paid for. Well, I don't know if I can be righteous or I can be sanctified and holy. God never asked you to do it. He only asked Jesus to be your holiness and your sanctification, and he asked you to identify in him as your substitute and your representative. So now you say, Lord, I thank you that I live a sanctified, perfect life because Jesus is my sanctification before my Father. He's my standard. How hard was that? That was the easiest thing you ever did. And God will honor it. You know why? You're honoring his word. Hallelujah. <clears throat> All right, let's go on here. So if you wanted to make that a point, you know, um, job seeking and all that seek the wisdom of God first <clears throat> the second thing I wrote down that's of importance is should I you know bless my food and water okay should I before I eat should I do something like that what about if I'm at a restaurant should I do it there too what will people think who cares what they think okay you're the light of the world you're the salt of the earth if you don't do it I, we know they're not going to do it set an example you don't have to blast it. Okay? Amen? But you know what your mind will say, though? You know what? You know, this food's good that the restaurant's going to give me or what I'm eating at home. It's okay. Every other day I'm reading that Ebola's here and this one's Salaman is over here. And I mean, you know, who knows what's in your food? The pesticides, herbicides, all your vitamins and nutrients have been extracted out, maybe by design, and most people may say so. But you think that that food's okay and the natural? No. Or this restaurant, you know, is following all the codes of the city and the county. You know, so it's got to be good after all, right? It can't be wrong. No, you're wrong. It could be wrong. That food could be designed to cause you trouble in life. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 and see what good and evil is telling us to do. Okay, should we do the tree of life or the knowledge of the tree of the good and evil? Let's see what God's word says to say. Go to the book of Timothy, chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 4 and 5. Hallelujah. God is good, amen. It says here in 
1 Timothy 4, verses 4 and 5. For every creature <clears throat> under the creation, in other words, of God is good, and nothing to be refused, okay? Well, you know, not every creature. I'm not going to eat, a, you know, beetles and caterpillars, believe me. <clears throat> now watch this. If it be received with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a big part of this equation. <clears throat> thanksgiving connotates possession. You never say thank you. Somebody offers you a pen, you reach out and take it, and you say thank you. Why? Because you're a possessor of it now. Lord, I thank you for your healing in Christ Jesus. You're now you're a possessor. Verse 4, For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving. Verse 5, For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. How do you sanctify your food? Using the word of God, the tree of life. Not saying, oh, I, I assume it'll be good. In this day and age, your food and water could be quite contaminated, saints. Believe me, the lead in the water is outstanding. No, and there's no municipality that's immune or exempt from this, <clears throat> unless you've got a great water filter. But still, as an honor to God, you still bless your food and water. Amen? Verse 5 again, for it is sanctified. Didn't say maybe. <clears throat> Notice what God does. God says, you put me first. Put my standing and my protection hovering over you, you know, on the line, and I'll back it. Because it says there, for if it is sanctified, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer, that food will be sanctified. What does that mean? Every evil intent that's in there, the wrong nutrients, okay, the omission of nutrients, too much of one substance, not another, modium sodium glutamate and all the sodium that's in this, Lord, Take it, excess of it out. What about calories, Pastor? Can't be overly stupid about things, right? <laughs> Amen? But sanctify it with the Word of God in prayer, and God will bless it. Now, also when you sanctify it, you get a side benefit. Lord, double this meal and feed our brothers and sisters that need it throughout the world. You get another benefit. Lord, this meal will now be more nutritious than it was ever designed to be or intended to be, and it will bless my physical frame and body more than... I could have ever esteemed. Now I've got God putting his hand of blessing upon that food, and he'll put those nutrients back that were taken out, or cooked out, or extracted out by bad, you know, uh, soil and so on and so forth. Hallelujah. But notice, what did you just do by this whole exercise? You used the tree of life. You used the word of God. You didn't go to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to determine what is good and evil. You said no. I'm not going to lean to my own understanding. I'm going to believe God's word. You don't know what's behind that. Who cares? God knows, though. And he said, thank you for putting me first. You just avoided a catastrophe because that food was contaminated. But you didn't know it. God blessed it, turned it around, and it made was great nourishment to you. Next people have the same meal. What you did, they're in a hospital. That same day, that same night. What was the difference? You put the word of God first. They didn't. You got blessed. They received the devil's curse. Simple as that. Let's go on here. <clears throat> Another thing, I put down number three here. Okay, you get in a car in the morning. <clears throat> what do you do? Well, here's what I do I take Pat to work afterwards. First thing I do, I'm always praying. Pat and I do the 91st Psalm. Okay? Why? It honors God. Honors God. And I do some additional prayers. Like, Lord, I call this car into the kingdom, into glory. In the kingdom, there's no accidents in heaven. There's no destruction in heaven. There's no excessive wear and terror that happens in, in heaven. The glory shines in heaven. Remember what the glory is? It's anti-death, anti-aging, anti-corruption. Now I've called the glory in, which is anti-death, anti-aging, and anti-corruption to the car. <clears throat> does the car break down at times and wear out? Sure it does. But it would have broke down and wore out ten times sooner if I wouldn't have done that, though. Okay? As we're building our faith in this. What's the next thing you do? I call it into the kingdom. Totally. There's no accidents in the kingdom. There's no evil in the kingdoms. <clears throat> There's no destruction in the kingdom. Now that I'm in the kingdom, and I'm an ambassador for Christ, every time those wheels turn, 
they're turning on the embassy of God. I'm an ambassador, so I have an embassy here, right? In these United States. But if I don't call the car into the kingdom, there's no embassy that I'm, I'm, my car is under or that my feet trot upon. I go to my workplace, I call it into the kingdom. Why? Now every time my feet walk, it's in my embassy where God can move in his jurisdiction because now he's been invited. Well, back to the car. So what else do you do? It's in the kingdom. So now, Lord, I thank you that we're accident-free. We're totally blessed. We're alert. We're on the roads. And wherever those wheels turn in this embassy, the roads are now, what? Blessed and sanctified. What does that mean? That there will be no accident evil befall us. I'm not going to have a drunk on the other side of the road, you know, turn in, you know, into us and crash and give us a head-on collision. Because the roads are sanctified to and fro on the other side as well. <clears throat> you really do that? Absolutely. Well, why does, I, I remember I was at a place and a person said to me, uh, why, do our, why do accidents, car wrecks happen to some people and don't others? I go, 91st time, they use it, you're protected. The other guy didn't, he's dead or injured. Simple as that. It doesn't, it's not complicated. Okay? So I do that. Okay? I said, Father, I thank you that the roads are blessed. And I come in, you know, and I'm developing this, not always, but a lot of times if you do it right and you start developing in this, say, Lord, I thank you that all the traffic signals will be green when I get there and I won't go through agitation. Now, Pat and I got to talk to the engineer here in, in Cheek to Wag on a couple of signals, but other than that, they, they pretty much follow our, our, our way and we're growing in this, okay? It's good. It's a great exercise on some of these things, amen? Well, that's a little foolish. You're going to bother God for a red light? It's not a bother. It exalts him. He thrives when you get him down into the incidentals of life as well. Okay, the most minute things. My son calls me before he leaves or sends me a little text where I'm on my way. You know what I do? The minute he sends that to me, I say, okay, safe travels or safe passage. And I immediately close my eyes for a moment and I say, Lord, that car is divinely protected now with the blood of Jesus. Okay. He come, lately has been going home with a guy by the name of Josh. I go, Lord, cover Pat and Josh with the blood of Jesus, the glory of God, and put a glory shield, okay, a face shield, <clears throat> a blood shield between them. So if any, any of them picked up something from work, it's not going to pass from one person to the other, and they can get sick. But that road is also now divinely, what, sanctified and protected all the way home and also on the way back the other side of that road. So that a drunkard or somebody else is not going to hit him. I do that all the time when he remembers to do that. If he doesn't do that, then, you know, hopefully God, you know, hopefully he did it, okay? But th now, what is happening? My mind's always thinking about the Lord and what, you know, how he can help me through this situation. My family's divinely covered and protected now, okay? So do those things. Those things exalt God. What am I, every time I do that, what am I doing? bench pressing. I'm exercising. I'm getting stronger. Muscles are getting more tuned, spiritual muscles speaking. And before you know it, as time goes on, it'll be second nature for you to do it all the time. And it's always going to work and you're going to be full of joy because it's always working. You're going to laugh and say, I can't, this is just wonderful. It's always breaking my way. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Like Tony went away yesterday. When I found out about it, the first thing I did was cover him. That's why I wanted to know when he was going to leave and what time he was going to be home. Same thing, I did it over him. You know, a parent will do these things, amen? <clears throat> so you get in the car in the morning, you, okay? Some people don't say the 91st Psalm. They're going to be trouble. But do the 91st Psalm, amen? Have your angels, call them out. Well, it's in the Psalm, why do I have to do it again? Just say, thank you, angels, that you're encampeth around me and protecting me. I thank you that the blood is over me. We're in the kingdom. Do it over yourself. Okay. You loosen that blood upon you, calling yourself into the kingdom like we talked about. And if you don't do it, wrong tree. You got in that car and say, oh, nothing's going to happen to me today. After all, the car passed inspection. You could, fine. Your car could be perfect, but the guy across that hit you in a head-on collision could have had a heart attack, his car could have locked up the brakes, who knows, but his car didn't pass inspection. We Are you willing to take that gamble every day? Okay. <clears throat> Your mind says, okay, I'm okay, 
everything's good, you know, what are the odds of me getting into a car wreck? All it takes is once, okay? You didn't discern properly good and evil. But if you use the word of God, like I talked about a moment ago, you discern properly. Now you exercised and used your words of righteousness. So you use the words of your rights. You had a right for divine protection. You have a right to call forth divine protection. Amen? And if you do it, get crashed, you go to heaven, and the Lord's, you know what the first thing the Lord says? A lot of people think, oh, you're here, I love you. No. First thing God says, what are you doing here? Why are you here early? You're, why are you here before your time? Well, Lord, I, you know, I just got in a car wreck. Yeah, I know that, son or daughter. But you didn't use the 91st Psalm. You didn't camp with the angels around. You didn't put the blood of Jesus over you. Well, I didn't know I was supposed to do that. Lord will say, why weren't you at Pastor Pat's church? He would have told you to do that. I'm only kidding, of course. God's got a lot of ways to get these over to his people. But I'm trying to tell you something here. A lot of people go home prematurely, and it's not his way. Hallelujah. Let's go on here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, Pastor, I'm not so sure I, I want him to have been told this, because now I'm accountable. You're accountable whether you're told or not. <laughs> right? You're not going to get away with that. Hallelujah. Let's go to John chapter 10, verse 4. John chapter 10. John chapter 10 is huge. There's a lot of great scriptures in this. I could give you uh, verses here and we could never come out of We'd be doing this day and night. Go to chapter, John chapter 10. Now in verse 4, <clears throat> I never want you to be in fear hearing the Lord's voice. I told you last time, you know, you could get in your car, things are great. You've been praying. You're praying in the Spirit on the way to work. You listen to Pastor Pat's message as well. Half of it there, and on the way home, we listen to the other half. You do that now, right, saints? Right? You're doing that, right? And so, you exalted God, and uh, all of a sudden, you get this impulse inside you slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down. Why, Lord? There's no traffic behind me, in front of me, and my rear view mirror, there's nobody behind me, and I got a green light. Slow down. Guy's got a red light on the other side, and zoom, goes right through. If you wouldn't have slowed down, you would have got T-bone, you would have been in heaven. Okay? Left your family here, though destitute. Not, what, not a place where God wants you to be. You were sensitized yourself to discern good and evil. You've exercised yourself. You chose the tree of life. God was now able to get his voice over you. Well, where is that in the scripture that I can hear his voice? Okay? John 10, 4. And when he puts forth his own sheep, you're part of that flock, he goes before them, he did in the cross in three days and three nights in the resurrection, and his sheep follow him. Amen. For they know his voice. Why well, don't I've never heard the voice of the Lord before? You just called Jesus a liar. He said they you know his voice. Well, Pastor, I'm, I, I don't I, you know, I, I don't think I've heard from the Lord. I know you haven't. Well, how did you know that? Because you said so. God's only honoring what you're saying. Well, I never hear. I know you never hear. And you're never going to hear. Because you said so. But the scripture says that my sheep know my voice. So am I going to believe God or you? Okay? For they know his voice. I trust God's word. Look at verse 27. In case you didn't believe him there. Sometimes you don't believe God the first time. You've got to say it again. Verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. Oh, are you part? Of, are you saved? Are you born again? Are you a new creation in Christ? Have you accepted Him as your Lord and Savior and been cleansed by His blood and received His eternal life and received His peace? My sheep hear my voice. So if you're not hearing His voice, get yourself born again. Okay, that's why you're not hearing. And I know them, and watch this, and they follow me. They follow me. Oh, that's a promise, saints. That's the tree of life. He's giving you a promise. Listen, I'll talk to you, I'll speak with you, I'll commune with you, and you'll follow me. Now, I'll give you a little levity here just for a moment. <clears throat> I have a car. My license plate, New York State license plate, says Jesus. So sometimes people pass me, and I go, 
You're not supposed to pass Jesus. You're supposed to follow Jesus. <laughs> I, I catch up to Michael like this. I roll my window down. This has happened a couple of times. I said that and they laughed. Because I, you know, I knew that they were a Christian. They had another bumper sticker or something. But you're supposed to follow Jesus, not pass him in life. And they cracked up. But that's apropos, in a sense. Amen? Okay, let's go on here. Hallelujah. <laughs> How'd you get that license plate, Pastor? Prayer. Think about, it. at the time, uh, New York State was the second most populous, was back in the early 80s, um, state in the Union. And... Um, uh, you know, I, God had blessed me uh, with a car. We were, I was with a particular business. I uh, was making a, a, quite a fortune. And I got a Porsche back then. And I go, I really want something on that car that represents and glorifies the Lord. And so I go, I wonder if there's anybody who ever took Jesus. And I go, are you kidding me? Yeah, somebody out there did. I called the state on the phone. There, at the time, you could call and order your vanity plate. A lot of people have vanity plates exalting them or their idol. I got an idol. It's called Jesus, okay? So I go, did anybody take Jesus? I remember talking to the person. They go, who? <laughs> so I go, that's probably available. I was thinking to myself. And uh, they go, spell it. And I go, J-E-S-U-S. Not Jesus, but Je no, Jesus, okay? They go, hold on. And I heard some clacking. Oh, you want it? Claim it. I go, yep, yeah, I want it. Claim it. Got the vanity plates mailed to me. Put them on the car in the Porsche. Okay. Only on the back. I left the front off. And wherever I'd go, the car exalted Christ. I remember one time I went to see an evangelist at the Full Gospel Tab over in Orchard Park. And there was no parking spots. So I pulled right into the front where the front door was. And I let Cindy and the kids out. I only had two. They fit in the back. They were small. And I parked the car right there. So everybody came out and I saw this gorgeous red Porsche, 944 Turbo, European version. It was spectacular. It really was. And it had the Jesus plate on the back. And they go, holy macro, that must be that pastor's church uh, who owns that. You know, Tommy Reed at the time. I came out and I go, no, it's another pastor who owns that. That's me. And I, where I go, God got the glory. So, you know, this happens. Why? Because you're renewing, you're saturating, and all you're thinking about is Jesus. Amen? We're going to unhook there, saints, because we're you know, past the time. But next week, um, make a note that we left off talking about driving a car. Amen. Now, next week, however, I'm going to tell. I'm going to just give you what we're going to go over. It's going to excite you. And don't miss next week. Have everybody tie into next week. We're going to talk about what do you do when you get symptoms of sickness and disease on you. Is it wrong to go to the doctor? Or is it right to go to the doctor? How do you discern? What do you do? How do you Put that balance. I'll give you a little hint. There's nothing wrong going to the doctor, but it's wrong not to put Christ first and ask him for healing first. And then if you still got the symptoms and are really driving you nuts, go to the doctor. But there's a lot more to it than that, and we're going to get into it next week. The next thing we're going to talk about is mandates. We're not going to get into any more about it right now. What are you going to do about it? How do you, What happens if they come full-blown and they attack you. God gave me some spectacular verses today before the study. I wish we would have got them in. But don't worry. When, when they're delayed with me, they saute more. They get more season in me and they'll be, it'll even be better next week. What about the next step we're going to talk about is relationships. Okay? Strife, arguing, instead of binding the devil, taking authority over him. We're going to get into all the keys, all the weapons of your warfare, how to take authority over everything. Probably next week will be the most important time that, we'll, we'll ever, that you'll ever get a message in this. Take that lesson next week and listen to it day and night forever because it's going to be loaded and packed. Get everybody you can in on that session next week. Okay? Not that this one's bad. This one went the way the Holy Spirit wanted because he wanted us to talk like a fireside chat today okay but you got a lot a lot of information on what to do as well so we're going to unhook right there father we just thank you for this time together we praise you we bless you we worship you and adore you i thank you lord god that the saints heard this with joy and i also thank you lord god that they are hearers and doers of this word and they're going to put into practice everything that we talked about plenty of examples that we did cover that for them to learn and to go over 
So listen to the message over and over. The one good thing about audio or video, you can stop it and write down the sentence, how I said it. Then put it into your own you know, mental vocabulary until all, all of a sudden it's second nature to you. So Father, I thank you that they heard the word, they are do doers of the word, and they are beneficiaries of the word, and they bear fruits concerning such. I give you the thanksgiving for that, Father. In Jesus' mighty and matchless name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Right now, while we're waiting, we're going to do the communion together. So go ahead and get yourselves your own little cracker, wafer, or whatever. All right. Now, I didn't offend anybody by saying cracker, right? I mean, in this day and age, everything's politically correct, right? Nobody here in this church is racist. Nobody in this room is racist. In fact, we all love Jesus, and we love God's creation and all peoples. Do I have an amen on that? Amen. Okay. And so while we're waiting for the communion as well, if you have it already, turn to the 91st Psalm. If not, Tony will put it on the screen for you in a moment. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. And then we're going to have the, the offering after that, so get yourselves ready to pray over your finances. And one thing um, I want to talk about that I talked to uh, Cindy about <coughs> yesterday is um, I'm going to teach you next week also about commanding faith. There's a big difference of releasing your faith, having the faith of the Son of God, and having commanding faith. Remember the centurion and all that? He didn't, you know, he was, the Lord, he understood how it all worked. He was in the army of Rome. I say to one person, go, he goes, to another, come, he comes, why? Because that superior officer, when he gave an order, they had to obey. Today, you go into the natural army that we have, what happens uh, if the, you know, the sergeant gives a private an order? It came from his commanding supervisor or superior. But that private will do nothing unless he's commanded or what? Given an order to do such. We're going to talk about commanding faith next week as well. And that every time you use commanding faith, bam, it worked in the natural. I mean, in the spirit world, right? When we read in the Bible, it works in the natural, as you see in our armed services. Guess what? It's going to work for you when you loosen your angels and want a demand of a miracle to come to pass in your life personally. Amen. So that's why next week is all, all important. <clears throat> Hallelujah. All righty. Saints, take the... The bread in your hand represents the body of Christ, which really we're one with. He's the head and we're the body. But we're talking about the Lord's body himself, the one that was on a cross as well, and the one who came out of the tomb after three days and three nights in hell. Say this with me, or meditate or pray along with me, Father, in Jesus' name. We just thank you, Lord God, that Jesus and his precious body on that cross he bore all of our infirmities, sorrow, sickness, pains, and diseases. By himself, he took it. On his own body, spirit, soul, and body, and he took it all out of the way. And by his stripes, we've been made whole, healed, and we're sound right now. We thank you, Lord God, that <clears throat> since we're bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, all of our organs, tissues, and cells are his. So we demand and make a command that every organ, tissue, and cell of our cells function in the absolute perfection to which God created them to function. And we forbid any malfunction in our body now in the name of Jesus. Why? Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Why? We glorify God in our body which is his. Why? Because by his stripes we were healed over 2,000 years ago and we're healed now as well. Father, our youth is renewed, not just like the eagles, but is renewed to that of the Lord Jesus Christ, his personal body. Therefore, our body parts do not grow old or worn out in any shape, fashion, or form, and they are renewed to that of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord. Our DNA is His. Amen. Our genes are His. Our cells are His. Everything about Him has everlasting life and immortality flowing through it and us as well. Why? Death has been abolished. Resurrection power surging through us right now. So meditate on an organ, tissue, or cell that you need or have a need and believe that God has already healed you of 2,000 years ago. See his healing power coming upon you right now and receive that miracle. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We believe we receive. Thank you, Father. 
If you've done that, you may partake of the bread. Saints take the cup. This cup is symbolic of the blood of Jesus, which he shed. It's before the very mercy seat of our Heavenly Father right now as a perpetual and everlasting reminder that Father's work for us, yes, the work of that cross, was justified. It worked perfectly. And when Christ came up out of the grave in those three days and three nights and took us with him, he is highly exalted because of it. There's something about this blood that's so efficacious. It's eternal. It never dies. It never loses its power or value to protect you, to overcome the enemy with, and to cleanse you from all sin and unrighteousness. It never stops. It's not a one-time event when you receive Jesus. It's a perpetual waterfall that's over you. A waterfall is a strong, strong thing, saints. It comes down crashing upon you. You got a little bit of dirt on your hand, your arm. That waterfall comes down and just blasts it right off you. You're under that waterfall, that blast constantly, so that there's no stain of sin, no stain of unrighteousness. But Daniel 9.27 says God gave us what? An everlasting righteousness. And he reconfirmed it in 2 Corinthians 5.21, where he said that we became the very righteousness of God the Father because of Jesus' finished work for us at the cross. If you believe that, as I do, and that he's overcome the devil because of that, and that we stand inside of Christ before our Father as our representative, sinless, righteous, and made whole, amen, and innocent, if you believe that, and you want those benefits and values, you may partake of the cup. Hallelujah. Saints, prepare your offering now. I'll get that before you. Hallelujah. God is good, amen. I'm convinced there's going to be an explosion of financial wherewithal shortly because it's going to take great, enormous wealth to get the gospel out, no doubt. And God designed it that way. Remember, God's not a debtor to his word. What he said in Genesis 126, he said, man has dominion over the earth, not Satan. Satan stole that when Adam fell and gave all of his wealth of the world to his kids who aren't saved, who are satanically controlled, where he's dammed up all of our finances so that we can't get the benefit of it to get the gospel out. So what God's going to do in these last hours, he's going to do a wealth transfer. Or it's going to go back to what Genesis 1.26 says, where we're the ones who have dominion over all the earth's resources and, benef and you know, we're benefactors of it. Either that or God, the devil was greater than Father's word, and that's impossible. So God has to have the wealth transferred. you understand why now? Because his word already said that we own it. Jesus redeemed us back into what Genesis 126 said. He reversed what Adam's fall was all about. Now we're back into what? A custodians of all that the earth has in its wealth and its resources, and heavens, by the way. It's according to his riches and glory that Father meets our needs, not just the earth. Amen? Because we're ambassadors from heaven. So, Father, we thank you for this tithe and offering, Lord God. And in this tithe and offering, we receive a thousandfold blessing and a thousandfold return. Furthermore, Lord God, it was done after the order of Melchizedek, where Jesus blessed the tithers and the people who gave into the ministries and to his cause. 
And the silver, therefore the silver, gold, and cattle of a thousand hills arise. Why? Because he's redeemed us back into our original posterity of being in dominion over all the earth. So the wealth of the wicked is ours as well. Amen. We command that transfer in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord God, that all that's out there has been earmarked for the church to have in these last hours of time. So get ready. Again, have that anticipation and a spirit of expectancy. And those are the ones that are going to get it. We thank you, Lord God, that your holy angels are going forth from the north, east, south, and west to expected and unexpected sources and are bringing us end time wealth to us personally that have been earmarked for our destinies to use. We thank you, Father, for all that. We command that all the money and resources that are out there today come to us right now, blesses us every day of our lives, and I bless everyone within the sound of my voice that they receive the wealth transfer into their lives that God ordained from the beginning of time. Receive that right now, both in this Zoom room, our personal church house here, and also all those within the sound of my voice that will hear this later on. Amen, when we get this video out. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Grab a hold of it like you would. It's right there. Grab a hold of it. Say, that's mine. I take it. That's mine. I'm not going to have the devil steal anymore from me. Hallelujah. And we praise you, Father, for all these things by and through the blood of Jesus. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Alrighty, saints. We're going to go into um, the 91st Psalm here. I want to thank all those who do tithe and give offerings into the ministry. You bless us exceedingly and abundantly. Um, and I thank you that you, I'm commanding that God blesses you back, protects your jobs. I mean, when you tithe, God covers you in every aspect of life, spirit, soul, and body, financially, physically, socially, and economically. Every part of your life is divinely protected. So don't worry about mandates, this and that, okay? Just know that tithers have tithers' rights. Amen. And we'll get into that in another teaching too. So, 91st Psalm. Tony should have it up before the camera right now. We'll recite it together here. <clears throat> Ready? Here we go. We who dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall lodge, abide, and stay under the shadow of Almighty. We do say the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, and my God. In Him do we trust. Surely he has delivered me from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. He's covered me with his feathers, and under his wings do we trust. His truth shall be my shield and buckler. I'm not afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at my side, and ten thousand at my right hand, but shall never come nigh us. On with our eyes shall we behold and see the reward of the wicked, as we've made the Lord, which is our refuge, even the Most High, our habitation. No, there shall no evil shall befall us, neither any plague come nigh our dwelling, no plagues. For he shall give his mighty angels charge over us, to keep us in all thy ways. They shall bear us up in their hands, lest we dash our foot against a stone. We shall tread upon the lion, adder, young lion, and dragon, shall we trample under feet. We shall tread upon serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt us. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore do I deliver him. I have set him on high, and because he's known my name. He's called upon me, and I have answered him. I will be with him in trouble. I do deliver him and honor him. What long life do I satisfy them and show them my continued, ongoing, everlasting, perpetual, and eternal salvation, which is my Jesus. Our health, healing, wholeness, soundness, deliverance, preservation, safety and assurance, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Now, saints, before we unhook here and close, Let's um, pray for the nation of Austria. Not Australia, they need it too, actually, but Austria. Father, we lift up that nation to you right now, and actually Australia as well as our own. And Father, we cover that nation with the blood of Jesus. We put the, them into the kingdom of Almighty God where there's no evil or destruction upon them. We encamp with every person, Lord God, including the leaders of that world, 
by covering with the blood, the strong angels of God camped around them, and the kingdom of God activated over their nation. We break the power of the devil off of those leaders right now with these unjustifiable mandates, and we thank you, Lord God, that that nation is free. Australia is free. The United States is free. And all the nations in the world, within the sound of our voices, are free as well. We send forth, Lord God, the angels of Almighty God to do a mighty deliverance, a mighty breakthrough, and set these captives free right now before it gets entrenched. We give you the thanksgiving, Father, and we give you the glory. And let it be a testimony unto the power of thy holy child, Jesus. And we thank you, Father, for this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I'm going to do a closing prayer right here. Father, as the saints go out and have their week, we bless this week in advance. I thank you that they take the message of this lesson, they put it into everyday practice, they hear it over and over, and they get their minds renewed, Lord, over and over. Where the spirit world and the word of God becomes more real than this natural world, where they default and they use the spirit for, of God and the word of God for everything in their lives, where fear hit can no longer dominate your people, or anxiety or trepidation, but not only faith, Lord God, boldness, dominated by your caring love and compassion for us, and us for loving one another. We thank you, Lord, that we consider this thing done now. We believe it's done now. We receive it being done right now, Father, by and through the blood of Jesus. I love God's people said, Amen and Amen. Now, saints, as we unhook here, um, call me if you need me, text me, phone me, email me. We at Spirit Word Ministries do love you with all of our hearts, and we thank you for all these things now and by and through the blood of Jesus. Have a blessed week, saints. Amen and amen. Amen.